Okay, folks, a few more minutes to arrive. Uh, as per our tradition, we, uh, we wait for uh, uh, last minute arrivals to get here uh, from work uh, as they take their lunch hour. And I know my wife Carla usually uh, r r rides up at the last minute on her bicycle, so uh, the construction we'll, wait, at the corner. we'll wait a few more minutes. Is that her there? Oh, I'm not going to put my hair on the cloud a long time. Matter of fact, I'm looking for a new hair here so why don't we get started oh and here's Carla as well <laughs> as predicted <laughs> well welcome everybody to the fall session of UNBC Northwest's uh, public presentation series aka our speaker series uh, aka the uh, traveling road show of, uh, of talented guests and uh, residents of, uh, of Terrace and the Northwest uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Uh, thank you so much to you regulars. I also see some, some new people, so uh, we hope we'll see you again. Uh, before we get into our, uh, our uh, topic of the, of the day, I would just like to outline the, uh, the, uh, session, the, uh, the schedule as we have uh, laid out for you. There's a copy that you can take home and uh, put up on your refrigerator if you like. Interestingly, this year we designed it all around the first volunteer who was Rob Bryce and wanted to talk about ghost towns as close to Halloween as possible. So everything was then offset by two weeks from there. But then we just we had the opportunity to uh, entertain these folks. So we have another presentation a week from now. So there's one on the 7th today and another one on the 14th. So next week, we're going to have one of our professors, Alex Lautensock, walking us through the REAP Manifesto. So Alex is a professor in the education <laughs> program. Uh, but he also has uh, degrees in, in biology and is, a, is an active uh, in, environmentalist as well. So he'll uh, be exploring uh, what it might mean to have a positive vision of the future rather than just an apocalyptic one. So, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, after that, Rob Bryce with his ghost towns just a few days before Halloween. Then we're going to get off kilter because we'll miss um, the, uh, the Wednesday that happens to be Remembrance Day and we'll skip to November 18th for a film about Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. And that'll be sort of a, not just the film viewing, but also a bit of a, a, of a discussion session about the, the theme there, the power of one voice, the, the importance of, of women in mobilizing much of the, uh, the activist uh, community for social and environmental justice. Um, Amy Klepitar and Matt Beadle will then be presenting a, a fun travelogue uh, on November 25th, describing their uh, essentially round-the-world tour on bicycle. Uh, so these are faculty members and former graduate students here who uh, took a leave of absence to uh, go exploring with two kids in tow. So that'll be interesting. Now I'm still waiting for a final confirmation from our local newspaper editor, Rod Link, that in fact he will be available on December 9th, but he has accepted in a general sense the challenge to talk about his role as editor of a, of a small community newspaper and, and, and uh, what goes into, into that job. So that's the uh, semester in overview, and again, I hope to see all of you out in the future. For today, uh, we have uh, the traveling roadshow team from up the road here in the Bulkley Valley from the Telquan Quick area. Uh, Mel and Evie Coulson and Daryl and Dinah Hansen, and they're going to uh, describe the, the Birchwood co housing project, uh, an overview of some intentional communities. And they come prepared not just with a, a slideshow, but you'll see a lot of additional materials around, around the room. And, uh, 
and I'm sure they'll have an engaging presentation. They even have matching burgundy uh, sweaters here today. So it's uh, 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 very clearly a, a, a coordinated <laughs> team effort. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Okay, so I'm the Daryl part of the of the foursome. Uh, yes, thanks, thanks uh, to UMBC for inviting us and hosting us today. That uh, we were we, we tried hard to get a venue, and this is perfect. This is a perfect one. Um, and uh, yeah, and thanks for coming. I mean, it, it, we heard it was a lunch talk, but I don't see many lunches, so. I don't know whether, where the food is, but uh, maybe we'll get to that later. So um, our talk today is um, co-housing, is it for you? Kind of a strange title maybe. Uh, we recognize uh, that it may not be for everyone, but we think for some people it's really for them. So we're gonna go, we're gonna tell you something about uh, co-housing in general and Mel Mel will will lead off with that uh, then uh, we have uh, as an example of northern co-housing we have uh, some some things to present on the Birchwood project uh, near uh, near Telqua uh, as Phil said we that's where we 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 made the trip today uh, from beautiful sunny Telqua I'd like to be able to tell you that it's sunny today in Telco, but it wasn't. <laughs> but generally, yes, generally it's sunny. Uh, so then after I, I do go through a little bit of what Birchwood is, is going to be like, because there's nothing there quite yet, then Dinah will, will finish off with a bit on uh, some of our values, some of our value discussions that we've had uh, in committee that, um, some of them are in draft, but uh, we, we feel that's an important part of our community, so there'll be a few slides on, on that as well. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, well, Mel can lead us off here with, with what, uh, what co-housing is all about. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Daryl. I'm the second part of this three-person tag team. And I've just got a, a short, maybe six slides, just to explain the, the co-housing principle, because some people will know about what co-housing is, there's probably other people who don't. They might confuse it with co-op housing, for instance. But co-housing is a relatively new concept in Canada, and I'll talk a little bit where it came from, um, and it is different from, from Co-op housing in many ways. So let's let's get, get going. So co-housing describes a neighborhood design that combines independence of private homes with the advantages of common amenities and a village support system. So the design, the, the key thing there is individual, self-contained private homes. So that is like any other development, but then. Um, there's a strong emphasis on community. So generally you would have a larger site and apart from your, your, your individual home, there are common, common amenities which everybody shares. And usually the, the, the main focus of the common amenities is something called a common house. So a community would typically have a 2,500 to 3,000 square foot common house. And in the common house there would be um, a, a large kitchen and dining area where the whole community can have meals. There'd be a lounge area. There can be other areas such as office, laundry, art space, uh, craft areas, kids' playroom. And this, of course, is available to everybody in the community. And then there are other outside um, common amenities such as gardens, greenhouse, possibly meditation space, workshop storage areas for uh, recreation equipment, <clears throat> this sort of thing. Basically, whatever the group th that's in the com community, what they decide to have. So we did a visioning session on ours, and for instance, we included things like an outdoor cooking area with a, with a wood, with a, a clay oven, uh, um, a sauna, and a sweat lodge. 
the root selling. So people can come up with whatever they want. That, that's owned by the everybody. So the typical ownership structure is that the, the homes are privately owned. And in our case, the one we're planning, uh, it's on a bail and strata. So people actually own their lot. They own their lot and they own their house. And then the rest of the, the land is held in common by so it's like a, a strata title uh, arrangement. So we're describing it a closely knit neighborhood. Um, the idea is to get back to the second point, bullet, the old traditional villages. Up to, up to about the 1950s, people tended to live in smaller villages where they knew each other and there was a community spirit. Um, since then, we've sort of got away from that where um, people are more um, um, individual. Um, that the, the, the idea of, of the um, uh, knowing your neighbor, that sort of thing, has tend, tended to, to slip by. So it, it, the idea is to get back to that uh, neighborhood, village neighborhood type of development like a traditional village and people supporting each other. So you know your neighbors, you, you can support each other um, and you can uh, recreate together, you can have common meals in the common house, that sort of thing. New trend in housing, <coughs> to put that into perspective, um, the idea grew in Denmark in the mid 1960s. Um, it took a while to get it off the ground because it was they had trouble getting financing. Uh, I think the first houses there were built in, in 1973. But after that, it did take off, and there's something like 300 co-housing communities in Denmark. And in fact, the government were using it as a social housing model until quite recently. They, actually, um, they used to subsidize co-housing communities because they realized that there was other benefits to the community in, far in, in terms of health, reducing healthcare costs. For instance, if people are living in community and they're connected, they're, um, they're much better health out outcomes. <coughs> there was a change in government and the, the later government withdrew the subsidies, so there's no subsidies now. Okay, it came to North America, I think in 88, where um, an architect who happened to be studying, who was doing his graduate studies in Denmark, when the movement began, he was interested in uh, how it developed, and then he went back with his wife, also an architect, and they, they spent 13 months in Denmark, staying in different communities, co-housing communities. They came back to North America, they wrote a book about it, which was published in 88, and uh, that sort of start, set the movement going in North America. And there are now um, about 130 co-housing communities in North America, and 121. 120 in development, approximately. He came to Canada in 93. The first one was in Victoria, Cardiff Place, and that was a condominium style uh, 17 unit, uh, more like a multi-story co-housing. And, and since then, I think there are now 11 in, in Canada and something like 15 in development. And, and we're all one that's in, in development. So, and, and again, we say new trend in housing. <coughs> is actually sort of rediscovering how people used to live, where they lived in community and, and people uh, supported each other. So through co-housing, we build a better place to live, a place where we know our neighbors, a place where we can enjoy the rich sense of community and contribute to a more, more sustainable world. <clears throat> it's interesting, this, the sustain sustainability aspect, the original founders of the co-housing movement in Denmark, and this was in the 60s, um, they already had this idea of building more sustainably, building smaller homes, um, more, um, uh, more eco-sensitive design, and, and trying to uh, cut down on the carbon footprint. And that's, you have a presentation about Rachel Carson, I think her book Silent Spring came out in 62. This is around 64, 65, and these Danish pioneers were already on the same track. And that's remained a cornerstone of the co-housing movement, is that the people have tried to build very uh, eco-sensitive type houses, and that's something that we're wanting to pursue too with passive solar design and things like that. So um, we say community is the key to sustainability, um, rather than individualism, where people want to live in 
three and a half thousand square foot homes and accumulate toys. Uh, that we don't think that's the way to, to happiness. Um, so uh, coercing system, there's social, economic, and environmental sustainability. In terms of social uh, sustainability, <coughs> the, the co-housing community is more or less self-contained. We have lots of facilities on hand so you don't have to drive long distances for uh, your uh, other needs, entertainment needs, and so on. Um, we uh, typically we design uh, aging place so that people can stay in the community as they get older uh, and that's um, such as having doors wide enough for, for wheelchairs, backing in for grab rails, that sort of thing. Something called universal design where it's you're designing for the um, people as they age or even if they have an accident. <clears throat> so that's kind of built into a design um, model <coughs> and as far as and, and, and there is uh, security too uh, people living close together knowing their neighbors <coughs> you are living in a more secure environment economic is sharing of skills when you're living in community you can sh share skills babysitting doing people's books or whatever so there is a tr uh, informal trading of skills <coughs> there is um, uh, producing food on site, for instance, uh, growing our own food, and <coughs> quite a few ways in which you can be more economically sustainable. And then in environmental is what I mentioned um, about the uh, houses that they design, they're smaller, and they're smaller because everybody has access to the common house, so the common house, in fact, is like an extension of your individual dwelling. So the, the uh, typically co-housing units are about between 950, 1200 square feet. Um, they're better than average insulation, uh, such as passive solar design, even active uh, solar design. We're, we're wanting all the homes that we built to have at least to be wired for, passive, for active solar. So if people put uh, solar panels on the roof afterwards, it's integrated into their, their wiring their electrical wiring. And also, even in the choice of materials, using, trying to choose locally available materials, in, uh, sustainable materials, and low embodied energy materials. So some materials, they take a lot of energy to, con to, to construct or to, to, to create, and others are much less, in, uh, contain much less in embodied energy. A typical uh, example is fiberglass insulation takes 10 times as much energy to produce as cellulose ins insulation. So then we would tend to use cellulose insulation. So in the whole construction of the project, we tried to be as environmental as, as possible. And, uh, and then such things as organic gardening, retaining as much of the la natural landscape as we can. Um, so to, to create a, a smaller carbon footprint for the whole community. And, and that, that has been a cornerstone of the movement. So th these are the eight common elements of, of co-housing. Participatory, participatory design means that the group works together with an architect right from the beginning, and they design the community from the ground up. So for instance, we, uh, the site plan that you see over there we, had a, we worked with an architect from the um, Sunshine Coast, Peter Truitt, who's done about five co-housing communities. And over the course of a weekend, we brainstormed and tried to come up with a, a pleasing site plan. In fact, we created two variations and then finally honed down on this one, which we call the bipod. We're just in the process of setting up a particip participatory design workshop with a, 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 a telco architect for the common house. So everybody will have input into that. What would you like to see in the common house? How can we incorporate this within a certain budget? And can we make some rooms multi-purpose, for example? So uh, the, the people living in the community, they design it the way they want it. Shared common facilities, I mentioned the, the common house and, and the uh, workshops, all that sort of thing. Um, that's a main feature. Designed for community interaction. This is the way the, the community is designed, and there's a few um, a few um, points such as a centrally lo to located common house, um, purposeful separation of the car, 
uh, I think the, the Danish pioneers realized that one, the other thing that was breaking down community was the motor car because people, they drive from the houses and they come back and into the garage, they go home. There's not a lot of uh, room for interaction. So the early communities, they separated the car to the, the perimeter of the site. People had to walk into the uh, community to the houses. So um, more chance of, of uh, community interaction. Um, another simple thing is putting the the active part of the house on the on the pedestrian side of the uh, of the development, so that if you're in the kitchen looking out the window, you can see people going by. You're more likely to uh, to interact. Ideally, if you can see the common house, you can see activities taking place there. So you might be more inclined to join in. So it's things like that that, that uh, goes into the design to try and create and maintain that community. Collaborative decision making, there's no one in overall uh, charge, like everybody, it's a horizontal uh, management system where everybody is involved and we use um, a consensus uh, model for making decisions. So we don't vote on things, it's um, you, you, you drawing on the wisdom of the whole group to try and come up with solutions and um, basically a, Consensus doesn't mean that you agree entirely with what's being decided, but you're not going to block it. So we have a system where we, it's a kind of a voting system, but it's basically, is any, does everybody agree or, or they're prepared to step aside and they're not going to block it. If, if one person blocks it, <coughs> then the, the, the decision doesn't go ahead. And there are mechanisms for say, sol solving those blocks. Resident management, we uh, look after the community ourselves through committees and um, maybe monthly meetings. Aging place design, I already mentioned, and uh, environmental sustainability. Shared vision and values, this is what Diana is going to talk about. A community gets on better if you have some commonality of, of values. And um, there can be such things as, as um, a desire to, to live a more carbon neutral uh, lifestyle, uh, care for the environment, uh, interest in the arts. <coughs> Um, uh, an interest in uh, maintaining uh, continuing education and passing on knowledge to others. So various things like that and donors on a committee that are trying to hone in on these these values and try to um, not just make them a mother state statements, try to have some way of demonstrating that we're actually living up to those those values. And then uh, so that's yeah that's the last one there, shared vision of values. And so privacy, this often comes up. Um, if you're living all cheek and jowl by each other, what about my privacy? Um, we, we need community to live meaningful lives, but we also need times to be uh, uh, by ourselves, you know, where we, can, where we can recharge our batteries and so on. So we say that it, it tries to strike a balance between, because you have your individual private home and that is your, your private side, um, and you have the common elements, but you, you just join in to those common uh, functions uh, as you feel like it. You, you're not forced to attend common meals, for instance. So you can sort of make the choice to be how, how public you want to be and how private that, that you want to be. So, so we, we try to address that, and, and even amongst our group, most of us are also uh, more, we, we're not, super extroverts. So, you know, we are concerned that, that, that we, we can maintain that, that privacy as well as being able to help each other. And then just a few places where you can get more information. This is the Canadian one. Uh, the Co-Housing Association is the American overall one. Creekside Commons, that's a community in Courtney, in BC. 35 units, we, Evie and I visited them last, uh, no earlier this, this spring. They have quite a good website with lots of information and also Belfast co-housing, that's one in the States, it's not Belfast Island. Um, good websites where you can get lots of basic uh, information. And then there's books and we have these books out here. Uh, senior co-housing handbook, we're, we're not necessarily a senior co-housing, we're a multi-generational uh, community that we're building in, in, in Talqua. Uh, because we think that better reflects the community and, and there can be an exchange between younger and older families, uh, a beneficial exchange. So Charles Durd, he's the fellow who sort of introduced it to North America. He's done something like 60 or 70 projects now. 
he's won United Nations awards and various architectural awards. Is is uh, quite a brilliant guy. We brought him to Smithers twice uh, during the course of developing these projects. And then this is a uh, I don't know if this is still in print, but this was another. I think they, these are Canadians. The co-housing um, handbook, which we have somewhere on display there. That's quite a good one. So that's my part of it. And we decided that we would take questions at the end rather than um, in between so that we make sure we get through the presentation. So now it's Daryl's turn. Okay. Okay. okay, so just a few comments on what Mel said. That you probably, by looking at the four of us, you probably uh, can't guess that we're inter intergenerational, multi-generational. We really are, it's just that the people that are the younger generation, they couldn't come today because they're working or kids are in school or something like that. So, um, now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Birchwood co-housing in particular. Uh, you've heard from Mel, there are lots of co-housing developments in British Columbia and, and, and North America. Not so many in other parts of Canada for some reason. Most of the, most of the Canadian ones are in British Columbia. And um, there, aren't, there aren't many in the north. So that, that is a particular, uh, something particular to ours. We're, uh, we're aware of one other one north of, uh, say, north of Nelson. There, there, aren't, there just aren't many in the north. And we're not sure why, but um, uh, maybe there are some challenges that we uh, that are particular to this kind of development in, in northern climate. So this um, this is a this is a wordle. If you're if you're familiar with wordles, uh, what we did was uh, we had a document uh, that described our our um, our development, what we thought our development would look like, and you just input the the document. Uh, word text into into a program and it, it, it creates a little a visual of what of what you think are, is important in your in your whatever whatever project you're working on. So the the size of the lettering reflects how many times that word appears in the document. That's all. Okay. So we're going to go through this. We're going to we're going to explain uh, uh, what what Birchwood is, where, what stage it's at, uh, and what we hope, what, what stages we hope it will, uh, it will get to. So this is what it's like right now. Um, there's some, uh, there's some bushed areas, uh, not, not, not heavy, not heavy, not big trees, but, uh, and then there's, um, and then there's some open, open field area, and there, there is good views of uh, three mountain ranges uh, to the west, the south, and the north. So not much there right now. Uh, this is uh, this is the same as uh, as the uh, as as the poster on the on the wall over there, uh, just a bit bigger so you can see it better. Uh, this is a this is a rendering that EB that EB did in watercolor. So we have the original that we're going to frame and hang in the common house once we get that built. Um, you can see some of the some of the common features like the common house is here. Um, the uh, uh, the houses arranged in two kind of semicircular uh, pattern with with a big garden area and two large green green spaces. Uh, we'll get to a little bit more on this when we get to the uh, to a more of a drafted plan, but this will um, this will get you started. Okay, so the location and some of the features. Uh, there's a map coming up that shows uh, that shows where we are in Telqua. Um, in general, we're on a bench be between Highway 16 and Tai Lake Provincial Park. If you uh, if you know the if you know the Telco area, there's a Google map coming up that will show that better. Um, the site that we've chosen is about 10 acres. 
uh, it's, uh, it's gently sloping. Uh, some of it's open and then partly, partly treed, lightly treed. Um, yeah, the mountain vistas to the three directions. And it has very good southerly exposure for uh, passive and active solar. Those were all, um, they were all criteria that, that, uh, you know, that we wanted uh, in a site. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a view of some of the birch tree, oops, sorry, wrong button. This is a view of some of the birch, uh, in a birch grove that's very close to where we are. And um, the, these little fun guys, um, it's uh, mm -hmm. one of the local residents, not in our group, but just a member of the community has taken to walking this grove and uh, taking little fungus and painting, painting mm -hmm. faces on them and then hanging them on the trees and the kids it's kind of like Fairy Island, I think, where, where, where you have those card faces. But uh, there's a lot of people like to go there with their kids and, and just walk and uh, uh, try, and find the, try and find the new faces that, are, that come up all the time. Okay, so here, here is the location map. Um, this is Highway 16. So Smithers is up in this direction. And uh, there is, uh, and there's Tai Lake and Tai Lake Provincial Park, the campground. Uh, the cemetery, if you know, if you know that, it's at the north end. So this, this, this ten acres here, uh, that will be, that will, where the development will be, is, is at the south end of a seventy-two acre par, seventy-two acre parcel. Um, that maybe someday, like it could have, it could have other, uh, could have other co-housing developments. Maybe one up at the sand, or or one one in here somewhere. Um, that's kind of that's long-term plan for this area. But uh, right now, uh, we want to we want to develop this 10 acres down here. So this is a bit. Not quite as not quite as aesthetic as Evie's, but but does uh, shows uh, shows some of the contours and uh, um, the, the same basic <laughs> development outline as as Evie's had. Uh, there's access here. Oops, that button is pretty small. <laughs> uh, so, like Mel said, the one of the one of the principles of co-housing is is. Uh, is a uh, it's a pedestrian development because we feel that if people are walking in the community, uh, it's a it's a friendlier um, place to be. It's a safer place to be uh, for children. So um, generally, generally in our development, people people park here and here, and then and then access their houses on these lots. Um, uh, by walking, these these uh, circular features here, these driveways, those are for emergency access, uh, ambulance, uh, uh, fire truck. We have to have those in Telqua. We have to have that kind of uh, access, and also for moving in furniture and things. But general, but there's a there's a block here, and a block here, uh, removable so that you can't drive in there on a, on, a daily, on a daily basis. So I mentioned earlier there is, like some people have told us that, well, in the north, like maybe in the winter, walking in your community might not be quite that, quite that desirable and, and some people can't walk. So what are you gonna do about that? So uh, we put in what we call, um, well, we don't call it. We got the name from somebody else. But there's this, 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 these four lots here have access to the back of the lot so that they can have their own parking. Those four lots. So, in um, just to mention in passing, we aren't the only um, we aren't the only co-housing that's going to be built in a in a that has a winter. I mean, there's the ones on Vancouver Island. Okay, they don't have much winter. But there's one in Lafayette, Colorado, 
not near, um, that has, they have pretty serious winter there. The one that Mel mentioned in Maine, in Belfast, uh, at Belfast, they, they, have, they have serious winter there. And uh, we ask people, you know, like, how do people feel about walking, walking in the community in the winter? And they said, oh, well, it's not a, it's not a problem. So, uh, but we still think this, we still think this garage row idea is good um, because uh, we want the community to be accessible for, for everybody. So that's, that's what, that was our, um, we added that later after, after many go rounds. Uh, just that it would be, it would be a desirable thing to have. So just a few other things to point out. Uh, these lots are 400 uh, square meters, so not very big lots. Um, the, uh, the, the lots themselves uh, are about 20% of the, of, the, of the entire 10 acres. And we have two what we call protected areas. It's, it's really um, not meant to be parks per se, but they're, they're not developed. There's no land clearing, there's no tree removal. That's this area here and this area over here. So we've called those no development. And they, um, they comprise 15% of our, of, our of our 10 acres. Um, yeah, common house is here. There's a workshop here and canoe and bike storage. There's a recycle shed here for the whole like a covered recycle for different different types of recycling for the whole community. Uh, uh, children's playground. Uh, well, the garden area for sure, garden area and orchard area for sure. And then uh, it's it's called a fire flow pond on this map, but uh, you could also call it a water feature. I mean, we we do need in Telco we need a certain amount of water. Um, for fire protection uh, that's, that's local. So uh, one, of, one of our um, intentions for sustainability and, um, and uh, is to gather water from, uh, from the roofs and from impermeable surfaces and direct that into this fire flow pond that, that we can use as a water feature uh, close to the common house. Um, did I miss anything? No, but we want to make sure there's time for questions. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's about the salient features on that. So house designs, what we did, um, we are selling lots only. Like, it, like it's, some co-housings develop everything. Uh, they develop the housing units as well. We're, we're only developing lots. So your people that, uh, that buy lots can, can design and have their own homes built. But we also did, um, we have some restrictions. The maximum size, the maximum floor area is 1,500 square feet. And can't be more than two stories. And what we did was we worked with an architect to create two passive solar house designs so that if people choose one of these two designs, there's some, there's some potential for cost savings. So this is one that uh, we call the Tai. Uh, it's a one story, two bedroom. Uh, it's 1,000 square feet of living space. It's about 1,200 square feet total footprint. And then the, the other one, the Babine, it's the two story, uh, three bedroom. Uh, both the same footprint as the Tai, but but on uh, one and a half one and a half stories. So this is a bit of a summary. Uh, there are 20 Bearland Strata lots. So I don't know if people know about Bearland Strata, but uh, that that's the that's <laughs> legally how they're uh, that's how you have your 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 own house and and your own lot, but you own you own commonly the, the rest of the property. Um, there's the lot, the lot size. 
15% uh, of the land protected from development, like I said, and then the amenities that I think we've covered, I covered in the map. Pedestrian oriented design, uh, that's the walking from your garage except for the four units. And then some things that Mel already covered. An important thing is that because we're doing the development ourselves, we, can, we sell the lots at cost. There's no developer profit in these lots. Okay? So whatever it costs to, to develop, that's how, we, that's how we determine the price. So a bit on the financial and legal. Um, the first one we've covered already. So the first, the first step in order to be, in order to get into this, it's about a twenty-five thousand. It is a twenty-five thousand dollars share shareholder loan to the to the corporation, and then um, once once that uh, that doesn't cover the whole cost of development, obviously. But um, after that, then we we have enough funds to go to the bank and get a and get a construction loan from from uh, a lending institution. We're estimating right now, we've done a feasibility study, and we're estimating the cost of a service lot is approximately $75,000 plus GST, of course. Um, and then to cover the common amenities, the main ones, like the workshop, the common house, and the covered parking, we're estimating again, and we're, work, we're trying to refine this number, it's about 20,000. And we anticipate very low strata fees because we're not we're not covering the strata fees don't have to cover the outside of the of your house they just cover the common house snow removal those kind of those kind of things. So here's some cost advantages that we we feel. Again, the lots are sold at cost. There's no developer profit. There's no uh, there's no realtor fee. Uh, Again, you're developing your own lot at, by participating in the development. Um, the site, the, the 10 acres, is uh, it's for sale at below the market price. So there's another saving for the community. Um, and then in I don't know what it's like in in uh, Terrace, but it's in Telqua, they have a, a thing called development cost charges. When you develop new lots, you have to pay the village seven thousand uh, dollars per lot. But because ours is an ours qualifies as an environmentally sustainable design, we get a reduction of fifty percent on the development cost charge. That's another saving. Um, Mel mentioned this homes can be smaller due to the common house. Secondary suites are permitted, so you could have you could build a small secondary suite on your on your property along with your house, and then rent that out, or or uh, um, yeah, rent it rent it to, and that would help you offset the, your mortgage your mortgage cost. And then of course uh, I mentioned this too. If you use these two designs, one of these two designs, um, there's there's opportunity to. Uh, to reduce your design and construction, your soft cost and your construction cost. So here are our next steps. We, we received a CMHC grant of $10,000, so we're designing and, and costing our, our common house. Um, next, we have to submit a development plan to the village of Telqua. We have very, uh, very good zoning for, the, for this property, so that should be no problem. Uh, it, it's very flexible, the zoning for that particular piece of land. Uh, continued outreach, and that's why we're here. Um, we need 14 lots uh, committed to get, to get the uh, construction loan uh, for, uh, to finance uh, the development. And then we would set up a development corporation to, uh, to, do, the, to do the construction, and then uh, negotiate the loan, subdivide and, and install services. So if we get the 14 people this winter, we could start we could start breaking ground next year. Okay, this is Dinah's turn now. Can you uh, manage that please? Can I manage it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can. I can step out of the way though. So the introverts took up most of the speaking time. So the extroverts gonna talk really, really quickly. Um, uh, first of all, it, they haven't mentioned the zoning. 
the uh, Telpa village has um, established this as a very generous uh, zoning uh, category. So small businesses are allowed it in your in your home. It's uh, you could have anything a pub, uh, a craft store, anything you wished. Um, secondly, I'm I'm going to go really fast through this because I think it's important that we have a chance to answer your questions. So just to let you know that we do have a really a uh, fine website, www.birchwoodcohousing.com. And you can find the information about our membership, uh, about the values and so forth. So please feel uh, free to, to check that out. Uh, you can see our relatively current group, although we've had several other young families approaching us through the website and other media and uh, are uh, very interested in, in what we could offer. So the membership, um, that too is established by committee, as <coughs> all decision making is done. And the group determined that we would have three levels. I'll go over them very quickly. Prospective, associate, and equity. Uh, for the details, do look at the website. But basically, prospect prospective members don't have to pay anything. Uh, they can attend meetings, they can join discussion. Um, they can pair up with somebody. We urge them to do lots of reading, to uh, uh, to learn about co-housing in general and virtual co-housing specifically. And as I mentioned, there's no charge for that. To become an associate member, then we urge them to attend five meetings if possible unless they live remotely, in which case we do lots of phone and email correspondence with them. Uh, they, of course, can have input into the design and, uh, and community processes, which is a real benefit to coming in early. Uh, they can contribute to all decisions that are made except financial, and they have access to all our correspondence, all our minutes through Dropbox. Um, the non-locals, as I mentioned, they can, uh, they can become associate members by doing many of these things uh, at, at a distance. Um, and then by paying a $50 membership to join the Bulkley Valley Co-Housing Society, they become an associate member. The third level is equity. Those are the people who are really committed to the success of this project. Um, they, uh, can, they have all the rights of an associate member, plus they can vote on financial issues. At this time, those of us who are equity members have made a $3,000 commitment. We've also received grants from a local uh, chair, well, a foundation in Smithers, uh, who really believes in, in what our co-housing project is about, and she has contributed $13,000 to move the process along. So the Values Committee, um, once again, getting together, talking about what, what do we want this community to look and feel like. Uh, one of our members said, I want to be able to see the stars at night. So we said, oh, there's a, sol a possible solution to that. You build your lighting down along your walkway instead of overhead. Uh, issues of quiet and peace and tranquility are really important to members. So we looked at how can we make that physical, physical environment fit the values of the people of this group. And we looked at issues. You can see the whole list here. And uh, we can even put it on the website so that you could see it in detail. Uh, responsible pet ownership seems like a small issue. It can be an enormous issue. And if we've talked about this ahead of time, talked about what matters to our group, um, then we can create, uh, quote, bylaws so that uh, controversial and contentious issues are avoided rather than dealing with them afterwards. And we think that's a really important part of discussing the values of our group. Um, do you want to Next one. Yes. Lifestyle, ambulance, safety and security. Um, okay, and then our next values that we looked at were social environment. Uh, Mel already covered the issue between private, the balance between privacy and community. Uh, lifelong learning, as all of you are devoted to, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, appreciation of others, inclusiveness. Although we don't have a lot of um, ethnic or racial uh, diversity in our group, we certainly hope to have a cross-section of ages, and we do have a cross-section of, um, for example, religious values, which we, I think really shows our inclusivity. Um, I think that I'm going to leave it at that, except to say that we do have brochures here and on the table here. Please 
feel free to take them. And um, I have a book here. If anybody would like to put their name down so we can correspond with them, we'd be very, very happy to do that. I'll put it right here. And uh, thank you so much for coming, especially those who wore the dress code. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to take the questions? Sure, we, it's can. important that you have time, Todd. You can. You no, can. no, I, I, I'll let you do that. Thank you. Okay, so here's the motley crew. Well, I, maybe I should move over here. It gives me heck if I don't stand in this particular spot here. Yeah, go ahead. So, does somebody own the 70 acres? Yeah. Actually, the, the 70 acres is owned by somebody, and that would be Dinah and I. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just wondered how that... Yeah, that's how we so can protect how the, yeah. how the whole thing gets developed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the plan of the community is kind of square. I guess that's to, f uh, to suit the lot uh, shape and, and central features. Um, is there any other requirement for a, a similar co-housing development, is, does it need to be um, more square? Can it be rectangular, short, uh, it can short side, long, you know what I mean? Right. So it, co-housing developments, they, they vary quite a bit. Uh, if you do, if you research the, the internet, for instance, you'll find a lot are, are, are urban. There's a lot of urban co-housing developments. Uh, condos, that kind of thing. There's a few in Vancouver, um, Burnaby. But uh, the ones that are closest to us that, that I've found are uh, Roberts Creek uh, on the Sunshine Coast, uh, the one at Courtney Comox uh, Creekside that Mel mentioned, and, um, and maybe the one in Lafayette, Colorado. They're, they're very rural, uh, lots of gardening um, associated with them. But as far as the layout goes, it, it's, it's just, I don't know. It, um, there's lots of different layouts, you know, like it can be almost anything. It just depends on, on, your, on, on what land you've got to work with and uh, more, than, more than any other factor, I would say. Any? Yeah? Uh, I'm not clear how it differs from co-op housing, so what, what the, what's the exact difference? Well, so much like <laughs> Mel had a slide, but it had so much rating on it, we had to yeah. take it out. So in co-op housing, you don't actually own your, okay. your house, you own shares. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the right to occupy the house. Uh, you can't just sell the house. It, it's the, it was the, okay. the the corporation cooperative that they sort of decide who lives there. It's it's gone out of favor right now because it, it came in as a way of promoting affordable housing. So there was government subsidies, and it, then it made sense. Now there are no government subsidies. It doesn't make sense because you, it's very hard to get uh, financing. Because you don't have actually have uh, you know a title to a property where the bank would take that uh, to. So the, here, because you do have the title to your house, title to the lot. So you can sell your house if you. Yes, want that's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How close are you to the fourteen houses? <laughs> <laughs> How close are we to the fourteen committed? Mm -hmm. We 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 think. I mean, some of it. Some of the commitments are a little bit fuzzy, but we think. We think we have eight committed. And there are a couple of others that are, that are close to being committed. So you might say we have 10. We got 17 in the group all together. Yeah. Right. Is that, yeah? So uh, let's see, how do I want to say this? So if you um, had uh, some sort of um, nursing or you know or a nurse living there or whatever who can maybe help the older folks um does the province recognize does bc recognize anything like that 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 could you know perhaps help with um health costs or yeah. i don't I, know exactly yeah. how i, I don't think that. the province does it's actually a very good point because in one thing we didn't mention often the communities have guest rooms and that idea of that is that you don't need an extra bedroom in your house because if somebody's visiting, you can put them up. Often the guest room's in the common house, but they can be separate. So there's a place for them to stay. In some cases, those guest rooms can be used for a living care caregiver. So then they're right on the site, and, and they, they, so it enables you to stay in the community until, uh, until you really have to go in the hospital or something. 
So, but there is no, and it makes a big impact on, on healthcare costs, but there's no recognition of that by the provincial government in the way of subsidies or anything, oh, which is a pity. For, for our particular development, we have two nurses from Edmonton that are looking at, <laughs> at, uh, at relocating to the Bulkley Valley. So we're really encouraging them. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeannie is a nurse, and, and, and Heather is, is, a, yeah. is a senior, uh, uh, yeah. looking up the senior. Yeah, Jeannie, Jeannie's a nurse, and, and Heather, uh, she worked at the Bulkley, Bulkley Lodge, so she's, she knows about working with seniors. So are you saying maybe the maybe people who are doing these things kind of would form an advocacy group later on, or it could be, yeah. I mean, it, it, the group can do anything it wants, right? That, that, that's the beauty of, of this kind of group. Uh, you uh, you you set how you want to live, and you set you, you you design everything. The what like what the site looks like, what the houses look like. Everything you make all those decisions. Thank you. Yeah, and, and one of the our society, one of the provisions in the like the, um, the, the what do you call it the the, the initial um, purpose of the society is to promote co-housing. So we want to develop this project, but we also want to promote co-housing in the north, mm -hmm. and and something like that would be something that the society could work on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, yep. And I'm not sure if you've mentioned it, maybe you already have. How much um, is an estimated cost for such maybe a one bedroom Thai housing? Okay, so we are we are getting, so I didn't mention it. Right, we didn't mention it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the best estimate I can give you right now is, is $160 a square foot, which is kind of not a very useful number in some ways. If you build, if you build something yeah. smaller than one of those designs, uh, you know, probably actually the Babine is a, is cheaper per square foot than the Tai because it's got it's on two floors and the and the foundation is smaller. Um, <coughs> but in some ways, you could set your own budget. Like there is no minimum size here. You could build, you could build a 700 square foot house or or even smaller if you wanted to. Um, yeah, there is no minimum. There is no minimum house size. There's a maximum of 1,500 square feet, but no minimum. We had set a minimum, and then a young fellow came in and he said, "Well, I want to build a tiny house." We said, "Okay." <laughs> we take away the minimum. Yeah. So often things are in flux simply mm -hmm. because people are bringing new ideas. People do more research. They find out something works better. Or, or certain people have certain uh, interests or economic restraints, whatever. And we say, yeah, we, we want to make this work for people. How can we make it work for everybody? And some people build their own house. We have some contractors in the group. Um, so we, there's considerable savings if you build a house yourself, you know, from the labor. There's roughly 50% labor materials. And we've also said it's possible to build a house to lock up stage get a contractor to build a house to lock up so everything is framed in, roof is on, and then you can go in and you can do the inside finishing and, and put the signing on or whatever. So there is a, a good uh, way of, of uh, saving money there because the finishing is the time time uh, using element which is expensive. So if people can design their own house, so to speak, does it have to pass? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Pick a design. As long as it's not bigger than 1,500 square feet, you're golden. Yeah, we have a, a few other guidelines too, yeah. like maximum 26 yeah. feet uh, and uh, non-combustible siding and things like that, just for fire safety. Yeah. So, there's one going forward. Are there any restrictions on buying and selling? I mean, if in the future I want to sell my unit, does the purchaser have to subscribe to the values of the society, or we think we don't. We're looking at other co-housings for to solve that or to address that. Um, they don't seem to have a problem. The people, it, it's a self-selecting kind of thing. If you don't, if you don't believe in, in co-housing, you probably won't be interested in, 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 you know, in being part of that kind of community. If you really want to live back, you know, uh, uh, 40 miles off the grid, you're not going to come. You're not going to come to us. If you want to live. Right in, right in a, a normal subdivision in town, you probably aren't going to come to us. 
you have to you have to believe in our values in order I think in order to to find to find it an attractive solution and that's why that's why going right back to the title of the talk you know is it for you you know everybody has to decide on their own whether this this style of uh, or the values we have and, and and the type of community we're developing uh, if it if it's if it's for you that's great if it's not then we're fine with that too it's just and, and many cars and communities they have waiting lists so people go on the waiting list if a house comes up for sale they're already sort of showed their interest in, in the principles of co-housing but it, it's your house it's your lot you're free to sell it that's, that's great when you sell it, you sell your own lot, your own home, and you are equal share of all the common assets. Yeah, you so you're entitled to the You're entitled to all of that, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So in essence, this is this gives each family, you can build 20 units, a half an acre of title, right? One-fifth of an acre for the home lot, and four-fifths of an acre per unit uh, of the common, of the commonly held assets. Okay. We should probably uh, close yeah. our discussion there. Yeah. Please join me in thanking our guests with their uh, and um, I'm sure they'll uh, stick around for one-on-one -on -one conversations if you'd like a little more information. So thank you, thank you very much for for, for, for joining us.